Welcome to a very special episode of Loop TV. I'm joined by Rob Maurer, man who needs no introduction. Tesla Daily, he is probably the most dialed into the Tesla story, or one of the very few people, I should say, that is hyper dialed into the story. Welcome, Rob. Thank you for joining Loop TV. Our topic today is FSD, full self-driving. And I just wanted to take a step back. Can you give us a brief history of where did FSD come from and where are we at today with it? Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, I would echo the comments, you know, got a lot of admiration for you as well, Gene, and thanks appreciate for having me that. on. I really appreciate it. So yeah, FSD, it's a long story. I, we can try to condense it here a little bit, but I think it first became a thing when Elon famously unveiled the D back in 2016, where he unveiled this dual motor drivetrain for the Model S at the time. And they said, oh, we also have something else. And that something else turned out to be autopilot, which actually ended up obviously now being a much bigger deal than the dual motor powertrain, which, you know, big deal in and of itself. But they kind of just added it as this one more thing a few so years ago. Let me ago. interrupt that. When they introduced autopilot, I'm thinking this is just cruise control, but a little bit better. Right, exactly. And I don't think a lot of people really grasped Tesla's full ambitions at the time because that was sort of how it was presented. Of like, okay, we're going to add this traffic aware cruise control. We're going to have these, you know, a little bit of lane correction and control there. But Tesla at the time obviously had huge ambitions for this. And over the years, it's become more and more clear. Elon has been more and more open about talking about their ambitions there. So um, let's, let's take it from 2016. They come out with autopilot. It's advanced cruise control. And what would be examples over the past three years of how autopilot has improved. Are there any kind of key features that you can point to? For sure. So that's what it's been all about is just slow iteration, adding new features. So they've added navigate on autopilot, which allows you to plug in a destination into your navigation. It will now automatically change lanes for you. It'll take exits, take on ramps, and it'll just navigate your entire journey with you just really having to on the highway, sort of let the system know that you're there, that you're paying attention apply a little force to the steering wheel. So from that original lane keeping, now it's added pretty much full control on the highways from on-ramp to off-ramp. And, and when was on-ramp, off-ramp? That would have been 2018 and 2019 is sort of when those features started to be implemented. And Tesla around. has this, it's been around for quite a while now. And Tesla sort of has this pathway of adding features and over time improving them. So at first it's kind of like, okay, well, you need to confirm your lane change. So it's additive, but it's not really taking over full control. Tesla tested that for a long time, felt comfortable that the system was working correctly. And then over time, they removed that confirmation requirement. So that's been something that's happened in the last couple of years. But since we've seen that autopilot, the feature set has kind of stalled in terms of what's been released for, I would say, the last 12 to 18 months. There have been small improvements, but we haven't really seen any game-changing features added. And right now, I think we're on the verge of really an awakening in terms of recognition of what's happening with autopilot and the feature set and what can actually be accomplished on sort of an autonomous driving system. Well, so the reason let me talk about bridging those two is where does autopilot end and FSD start? Sure. So it's a, there's, there's always a little bit of a blurred line there and Tesla over the years has changed it a little bit. It's gone from autopilot to enhanced autopilot to now this full self-driving sort of capability. And there's always been a little bit of blurred lines. I think if I remember correctly, navigate on autopilot. So where it's doing the on-ramps, off-ramps, navigating the lane changes all by itself. I believe that's a full self-driving feature. Tesla does list those out. So autopilot is standard, then you have to pay for a little bit more of these gotcha. additional features. So they're still considered two different products. They are. So yeah, autopilot would be standard right now. That's actually a really great driving assist functionality mm -hmm. that just comes standard on all Teslas. Then you have to pay for the previously $8,000, now $10,000 option for full self-driving. And before so, we jump into FSD, one final thought on autopilot, how would you compare it to what else is out there? Super Cruise gets some accolation. How do you compare the lead that autopilot yeah. has versus other cruise control? I think it's a matter of differences in approach. So Tesla is really focused on making this available to all their customers at all times so that it's adding the most amount of utility. Super Cruise is a little bit more focused on being conservative and being safe. You know, Elon would say that autopilot does add safety. And I think a lot of Tesla customers would agree with that, but Tesla's, you know, they're a company that's always pushing the boundaries a little bit. A company like GM with Super Cruise, they're a little bit more hesitant. So if you have a vehicle with Super Cruise, the availability of using that feature is going to be pretty limited to relatively straight highways in very specific circumstances versus autopilot. You can 
kind of just turn that on whenever. If you're in the city, you can still use it. You just have to obviously still be monitoring it. So Tesla's approach is very different in terms of allowing just more functionality and more opportunities for use than some of these other driving assist features from I can tell companies. you, I have a 2019 Mazda and it has their advanced cruise control and it's comical. There, <laughs> basically, there's no reason to even turn it on. Yeah. So I is it kind of just like bouncing back and forth between the lanes for the lane assist? Is that... Right. And the awareness of what's in front of it, it doesn't really have a good grasp of it. And the only thing it does well is if you're not holding on to the wheel or if it thinks you're asleep at the wheel, which I'm not, it sends a notification. But let's move on. One final question. If you're going to put a grade on autopilot versus the rest of the industry, how would you view that? Yeah, I think there's, you know, there's a few different studies out there. Consumer Reports has compared all these driving assist features. I think they had Super Cruise one, one slot above Tesla. I think they give it like an 80 out of 100. Tesla's maybe a 75. So sort of in that B range, C range. For me, I think Tesla is a clear cut above the rest. They're pushing those boundaries. They're offering more functionality. As you said, I think the functionality is better. I haven't personally used Super Cruise. I would love to do that. But I think it's, you know, again, Tesla's really going for this wide open, can use it anywhere, progressing towards full self-driving versus a lot of these others are really focused on, okay, lane assist and, and things like that. So love it. I would say an A minus right now, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's kind of GM and Tesla and then maybe everybody else when it comes to advanced cruise control and then shifting gears over to FSD. And can you remind us what the current pricing on FSD is? And it's had some movement over the past year. Yeah. So this is definitely one I think that we need to focus on the most. So full self-driving originally, I think it was like a $5,000 option, maybe even 3000 at one point. As Tesla continues to deliver these new features, they've continued to raise the price. So going back to, I think in September, it was $8,000. Now, I think in mid-October, early November, they increased the price on that to $10,000. People always talk about Tesla's valuation compared to other automakers. And my favorite rebuttal to that is, all right, show me another automaker that's selling a $10,000 software option with mm -hmm. seemingly pretty strong take rates here, because that's really the difference in revenue and earnings and where Tesla's becoming more of that tech company versus just an automaker. And the Tesla that you turn the FSD on when you purchase that $10,000 option, is there a different computer on board that it comes with? Is there a little bit of hardware component to that as well? So they're all the same. It's really just a software difference. Tesla's belief is that over time, as they continue to develop the feature set, there will be a demand for the feature in all vehicles through a robotaxi network type of situation where really the economics of it just makes sense to activate it. Whether that's in a used vehicle that Tesla has purchased back after a few years, or whether it's that customer unlocking the feature to put it out there on some sort of Tesla network uh, type of environment. They just have confidence that they can have that hardware in all vehicles and that's going to pay off for them. And then as we talked about, they still utilize all that same hardware in the emergency assist features, automatic emergency braking, all the autopilot functionality, lane keeping, traffic wire cruise control. It's all built on the same hardware. It's just a software difference in terms of what features are actually being activated by the customer. Okay. So with the features, if you have FSD today, it would an incremental feature be like summon? Um, I believe Summon is in FSD. Again, these are broken out yeah. on Tesla's website. Navigate on Autopilot, I believe, would be one. So yeah, the lane change type of stuff, on-ramps, off-ramps. And then what Tesla's working on now, so kind of going back to the earlier point, is really expanding this feature set. And what I was saying is that for the last year, we haven't really seen a whole lot of new features, but that's because Tesla's been working on this core architectural rewrite of how the software fundamentally operates. And yeah. That's put them at a local maximum in terms of the actual customer facing features over the last year. But what we're seeing now over the last few months is that Tesla has actually started to roll out this new architecture. They're calling it the full self-driving beta to a very limited set of customers. And these customers are doing really incredible things in terms of feature functionality with this full self-driving beta. So we've seen the beta handle roundabouts, it's handling fully autonomously, it's handling unprotected left turns, it's handling narrow streets with undivided lane markings, with oncoming traffic. <laughs> One customer that has it actually just took a fully autonomous drive from LA to Silicon Valley. So that's 350 miles with no interventions other than just charging the vehicle. So let, me, so, let me interrupt here. This yeah, would be sure. a, is it a Tesla employee that has access to the beta that would be doing this or is it just a regular customer? So, so quite a few Tesla employees do have it, but this would be a regular customer. It tends to be customers that have followed Tesla for a long time, that Tesla is comfortable, that they, they have a good understanding of how the system operates. Got it. Um, so, so they're kind of a very select group. If you will. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, I would say very much so at this point, but then Tesla is collecting data from that smaller sample size, and then we'll expand it here pretty quickly this year. It might be good just to do a quick refresher for everyone, just about the levels of autonomy. And there are four or five levels. If you can remind me, Rob. Yeah, there's five. They're not my favorite to look at, but so level five is sort of the holy grail. That's anything a human could do, an autonomous driving vehicle could do. So that's all weather conditions, all locations, pretty much if a human could drive in it, the car can drive in it. Stepping down to level four, it's similar. There's no driver monitoring required at level four, but it can't necessarily operate in all circumstances. So it might be geofenced or it might not work in the rain or in the snow or something like that. Level three is sort of a hybrid. The best way to think of level three, I think, is maybe it's fully autonomous on the highway, but once you get into the city, it says, okay, hey, you need to take back control. So it's fully autonomous, but it, it, you still have to be attentive and you still have to be ready to take back control with, let's say, a five or 10 second warning or something like that. So Tesla actually today isn't even quite at level three. They're very close to that, but because the responsibility is still in the driver, that still makes it a level two system, which is sort of that lane keeping type of stuff that we've talked about that really everyone in the auto industry is at right now. It's just a differentiation within that level. You might not like those definitions, Rob, but you did a splendid job of making it easy for everybody to understand. When you talked about the beta version of a customer driving from LA to San Francisco, and would that fall in level three territory? So <laughs> that's why I don't love the levels because Technically, it's still level two because technically the driver is still responsible. So Got level it. three, the distinction that you hop over from level two to level three when some of the responsibility is actually on the vehicle. So the vehicle takes control. If an accident happens, the vehicle would be liable. The company would be liable. But could Tesla have a cake and ice cream moment, as I like to say too, where they can offer these features, but still tell drivers that you have to be attentive. So even though they are kind of level three functionality, it requires someone to be attentive. Right. So that's the distinction, right? Because from a functionality perspective, this is really level four driving. Got it's it. just from a regulation perspective, Fine. this would be classified. That's more a level huge two. deal. Level it four is. driving that is in the wild today from a standard hardware vehicle that's priced under $50,000. Sounds like science fiction. I know it's crazy. Yeah, exactly what you said. Like the model three, it starts at I think thirty seven, thirty eight thousand dollars you add the $10,000 software option, you're under $50,000 and you will have this exact feature set sometime later this year. <laughs> like under 50K, that's insane. Waymo's cars, which would probably be the closest comparison in terms of functionality. We don't have exact numbers on them, but they appear to be somewhere at cost, somewhere above $100,000 just because they have so much equipment and all the LiDAR sensors and things like that on them. And what do you think the gap is between the beta and some of these remarkable experiences? And I want to confirm too, I have talked to someone else who is a beta customer and they echo some of the same examples that you mentioned. So let's maybe take it as truth that is in fact what's going on in the wild today. What's the gap between beta to when it's actually available to everyone and some of the limiting factors there? Yeah. And that's the huge question right now, because we point to these examples, oh, FSD did this, like it achieved this, but from here, and this is what Elon has talked about for a while now, getting to feature complete where the system can actually handle everything, but that doesn't mean that it's handling everything perfectly, that it can just be an autonomous robo taxi with no steering wheel. We have a long way to go still, in my opinion, from feature complete to the point where sort of that march of nines in terms of reliability, where you can actually trust this vehicle to do a better job in terms of accident rate versus human driver. So that's the big question that is on everybody's mind. I don't know that anyone has a really great way of answering that other than just to kind of watch the progress as it happens. And until the beta is more broadly expanded, we're sort of limited to watching videos from these few select people, which who knows if they're showing everything, if they're showing all the interventions and things like that. So good you know, cautionary making, comment there. Yeah, and I think they're making think, really good progress. It's just a matter of that March of nines. Is the gap to that March, is it related to training the neural network? It sounds like the hardware piece feels like it's in a good spot. Yeah, it definitely does. And I actually just recently bought a Tesla. I've been holding out for many years. Oh, uh, nice. Just <laughs> investing in the stock, but- Model and color, like please, Rob. A red Model 3. So it kind of fits with the nice. theme of, of my logo on my channel for Tesla Daily. Yeah, I'm loving it so far. I'm sort of a weekend now, I'm getting used to autopilot and everything like that. First Tesla. First Tesla. So nice. yeah. Huge <laughs> I'm not a Tesla owner. I don't have one. 
I'm going to make sure our investors get paid back before I purchase. We're on track to do ahead of schedule, but I want to nice. make sure that gets done before I purchase Cybertruck. But kind of the same boat as you, a week into it, your early thoughts. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm loving it, but for me, the reason that I decided now was finally the time, kind of like you said, like, I want to pay back my investors, my investors, myself. So like, I have just been investing in the stock for years and felt like now with the 20 X that we've seen in the last 18 months or whatever, I felt like it was finally the time. And for me, really what the difference was with the full self-driving beta stuff starting to happen. I felt like it was time for me that I needed to get that hands-on experience. You can read about an electric vehicle and understand why it's better. But for full self-driving, I really feel like you have to be there experiencing it to kind of understand the nuances of it, to see the corner cases where, okay, maybe it's not working and maybe this is the reason why. And it's a little bit more difficult to sort of suss those things out through just reading or watching videos. So let me ask now, this as someone who's just new to the Tesla and you think about the FSD features, how would you describe it to someone who's not familiar with it when it is turned on? It's not perfect. It's far from it. Is it just take some of the fatigue off of driving? Does it take the edge off? How would you describe it? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a dream. <laughs> like we talked about before, we're really living in the future and I've read so much about it that to me, it's a little bit surreal because all these things that I'm doing have been expected, you know, by me for a long time. It really is living in the future. A week ago, my car's got 500 miles on it. Now the car's driven itself far more miles than I have drive back and forth from Milwaukee to Chicago. It's handling 90% of the drive. I'm just there sort of overseeing it. And that's just going to get even more and more in terms of the percentage of control towards the vehicle versus the driver. What are you doing when the car is doing most of the work while we're seeing it? Are you like eating? I'm I'm just eating. I'm just eating the whole way. Yes, I would would be eating, but I'm trying to to understand the case of you trust the car, but yet you're not there. Are you kind of in the Zen zone? Well, I think you shift over from being sort of the driver in terms of a control sense to being the driver in terms of a monitoring sense. So what I'm doing is- mentally probably easier to do. Yeah, because you don't really think about it, but when you're driving, you're having to make all these little minor corrections. You're having to stay in your lane. Even if it's straight, you're still having to apply this focus to that sort of stuff. And with the Tesla on autopilot, it's taking care of all that little stuff. It gives you a lot more time to be attentive to your surroundings instead of focusing on those little micro adjustments. And then you've got the display where you can see all the cars that are around you, behind you. And it really gives you confidence that the system knows like, okay, this, this is what's going on. This is the curvature. My vehicle is centered here. If there's a semi on my right, generally it's going to give a little bit of space as I'm passing. It's a lot of comfort in terms of knowing that the vehicle is understanding its surroundings and you can just be the monitor of that and make sure that everything is as it should be. Great state of the union of where it's at today. Can you fast forward a year from now, make a prediction? Where is FSD? Do buyers care more about it? Do investors care more about it? What should we be looking for over the next year? I think we got the nice overlap of both care a lot about it, (laughs) but yeah, over the next year. um, So Elon Musk here about a month ago, and when he did a interview in Europe, he said that he's extremely confident of level five this year. So as we talked about before, level five would be full autonomous. It can do anything that a human can do in any circumstance that a human could drive in. I don't think that's going to happen this year pretty strongly. We'll see. Elon's timelines on autonomy have always been a little bit aggressive. I do think they'll get there eventually. But I think we are going to see a feature complete wide rollout this year where a Tesla can go from point A to point B with no interventions. And that's a huge step forward. And then from there, it's again, just a question of like how long it takes to be good enough where you can start to relax some of that control and Tesla can actually take on the responsibility if there are accidents. Because like you said before, they're kind of having their cake and eating it too right now where the customer is taking on that liability, which is an awesome circumstance for Tesla. But, you know, investors are really focused on, okay, when does that switch over and when can Tesla actually start making that robo taxi type of revenue? Please join us, by the way. It's a good lead for another episode of Loop TV. We're going to be talking robo taxi. Final thought here. I just wanted to get your quick take on the legislative environment and how that can be a headwind for getting FSD truly in the wild. Sure. So this isn't an area that I'm an expert in by any means. From what Elon Musk has said, Tesla's going to make its best efforts to get these features out there to make it a fully autonomous robo-taxi. And then from there, it's really up to when regulators deem it safe. I don't know that that's really what it's all about. I think from what I've read, it seems to be sort of a state-by-state basis. California allows testing of autonomous vehicles right now. 
I think Florida is another state that has pretty lax regulations where Tesla could pretty much start a robo taxi network there right now. And again, not an expert. So definitely, you know, if you're interested in that, look into it yourself. But I think we're going to see an individual state by state basis. And I think we're going to see pretty rapid acceptance of states that are willing to allow this type of situation, because in a way, they're all competing with each other to be more tech forward and to have that industry blossom in their state. That makes sense. It also feels a little bit messy with regulation and we know where it's going to ultimately go and whether Elon's right this year or three years from now, it's going to be a bigger part, definitely a bigger part of the story. The Tesla story has been dominated by a few years ago, manufacturing, more recently deliveries and raising money. And I think FSD is the next frontier from an investor perspective. Rob, thank you for illuminating. I'm going to leave on that note on behalf of Rob, Gene and Loop TV. Bye for now.